I just wanted to first thank you all so much uh, for coming here to support iGEM. If you haven't heard of it before, iGEM uh, stands for International Genetic Engineered Machine. It's an international competition. It started about 10 years ago. It's really grown into an enormous size. And what happens is, um, during the course of the year, primarily in the summer, uh, a lot of undergrads are taking their summer vacation. Uh, some undergrads are in the lab. Uh, doing the grad school deal in a way, and working on a project to present at a giant jamboree, which uh, these folks is coming up at the end of this week uh, in, in Boston, Massachusetts. And, uh, it's synthetic biology by parts, so they take individual genes, they assemble them into bio bricks, um, and they try to do something which I think any any grad student or postdoc or anyone else who's been through this before can, can attest to is quite challenging, um, which is complete a project in one summer. Um, and so we're very excited to have them here um, so they can share about uh, the interesting questions they've been examining this summer. And we can give them a warm welcome. So, thank you all. Mods, uh, thank you for coming, um, and thank you to the exec board for having us. Uh, volume, can everyone hear me okay? Great, okay. Um, so we are very glad to have you as a captive, uh, skilled, and seasoned audience uh, to practice the presentation uh, before we leave for our conference um, on Thursday and present on Friday. Um, so getting into it real quick. One second. While we uh, wait, I can introduce myself. Um, I am Jordan Harrison. This is Paul Perkovich um, and Sam Davidson. Um, Paul and Sam are both uh, uh, chemical engineering majors, um, and I am a biology major. Uh, I am a fourth year. Um, Paul is also a fourth year, and Sam uh, is a third year. All right. Yeah. Also, just a quick note, um, this is like a practice for our final presentation on Friday. So like, any questions you have are more than welcome. Also, any like critical feedback on the presentation. Or the style of the yes, that would be super helpful. Do you want to do <coughs> during the presentation or after? After would be uh, best. Um, so our project is called uh, CRISPR capsules. Uh, we have been investigating uh, pathways uh, to incorporate Cas9 into bacterial outer membrane vesicles. Uh, so for our project, we wanted to start with a very salient application and a problem, um, and we found this uh, problem in antibiotic resistance. Uh, this is obviously a huge global health problem. Um, in the U.S. alone, uh, annually, uh, antibiotic-resistant infections are uh, responsible for about 23,000 deaths. Um, and in the developing world, this is obviously uh, much, much higher than hundreds of thousands. Um, and you may have seen this. Uh, this was a cool project done recently. Uh, this is just a time-lapse video of uh, E. coli developing resistance to uh, an antibiotic in real time. Overall, it sort of uh, developed resistance to a thousand times more antibiotic concentration uh, than it began with over 11 days. So this is just representation of how fast this happens. Um, and this problem just keeps getting worse, uh, and our options for dealing with it have been dwindling since uh, the 1980s, as you can see here, and the number of approved uh, new antibiotics that have come out. So clearly what we need is a novel approach to this problem. And uh, uh, why not match a prevalent problem with a prevalent uh, solution? Uh, it's CRISPR, everyone's favorite gene editing technique. Um, so why would we use crispr cas 9 uh, to fight antibiotic resistance? Uh, this idea uh, was uh, first taken already by two researchers, each and every <coughs> at Rockefeller University and MIT. They basically did an experiment that's shown here that they targeted uh, Cas9 to an antibiotic resistance gene, both in bacterial chromosome um, and in the episome or plasmids. Um, and they found out two things, that if you target the chromosome, it just kills the cell uh, anyway. And if you target the plasmid, you basically uh, you cut out the resistance gene, and then you can resensitize bacteria and use traditional antibiotics. Uh, so both of these are good options. Um, in this study, um, the main obstacle that they identified was problems with delivery, uh, which I think is generally a problem in scaling up uh, CRISPR applications, sort of with anything. Um, so in the experiment, they found that their sort of in vitro uh, test 
was a lot more effective than their in vivo test. And uh, so in bacteria, they used phages to deliver CRISPR, uh, CRISPR-Cas9 encoding DNA. Um, so this is what I explored before. The disadvantages that both of these uh, researchers identified uh, were two things. One, uh, the bacteria developing resistance to the phages themselves, and then the organism um, with the bacterial infection uh, producing antibodies against the phage. Uh, so sort of dual kind of resistance. So, um, so we're looking to come up with a novel uh, delivery mechanism in bacteria. And sort of to come up with this, we try to go back to basics. We thought about all of the gene uh, editing techniques that exist in synthetic biology um, and we made an observation, which is that in all, all of the tools that synthetic biologists use, generally we have stolen from uh, bacteria and viruses in uh, their millions and billions year old, years old fight between each other. A lot of the systems that we use, basically all of them are uh, either sort of offensive or defensive strategies, sort of uh, invasion methods or sort of uh, protection mechanisms for um, bacteria. So this is, you see this in restriction enzymes and antiphages, and now in CRISPR. So with that observation, um, we took another tool in the bacterial arsenal, basically, uh, to develop our delivery mechanism uh, in the form of outer membrane vesicles. Um, so outer membrane vesicles, broadly, um, they are sort of buds released from gram-negative bacteria, um, uh, sort of that form from the outer membrane, and uh, there's a lot of different signals that can cause this to happen. Um, they're all sort of involved, though, in sort of loosening the outer membrane from the under, uh, underlying peptidoglycan layer. Um, but they have a lot of different purposes in bacteria. They're pretty cool. Um, one of them is sort of in uh, pathogenic bacteria, sort of uh, invasion strategy. Uh, but they also have a lot of more benign uses. Uh, these include, uh, as shown in this figure, uh, they can be used to sort of jettison uh, misfolded proteins and other uh, toxins. They can also be used in horizontal gene transfer. Um, in a piece of uh, poetic justice and dramatic irony, uh, several papers have actually shown that uh, sometimes uh, bacteria use them to cheat with antibiotic resistance and they will like send beta lactamases to each other with OMBs. So we're going to try to change that. Um, <laughs> so, so why would we use, uh, oh, and one more thing is uh, they have been engineered before in a lot of different ways to uh, incorporate uh, heterologous proteins. Uh, this ranges from GFP to different antigens. Uh, they've been sort of like uh, played around with for, uh, with uh, scaffold proteins <coughs> for sort of uh, metabolic engineering of different uh, reactions. And uh, so they're pretty well ca categorized, characterized for including um, sort of new proteins. Um, so why would we use all of these uh, to deliver Cas9? So this uh, has a lot of notable differences from sort of a phage delivery system in this, in that it's mainly that it's a whole protein delivery system rather than uh, delivering the DNA encoding for CRISPR-Cas9. And uh, we have a hypothesis that this could be better for slower dividing cell types because they wouldn't have to replicate um, that DNA. Um, we think they could also be better tolerated by bacteria than phages because uh, as I said, they sort of pass uh, OMPs in between each other. This is sort of a, sort of a native process, and uh, it's not really an attack on bacteria like phages are. And uh, there are also, we sort of hypothesize there could be some biosafety advantages. One, because our sort of uh, envisioning of the system is sort of a two-part system uh, where Cas9 and guide RNA are delivered separately. Um, sort of, so that would probably confer a biosafety advantage. Um, there's also possibly maybe an advantage with sort of the transients of the uh, whole protein delivery. Um, and now Paul is going to talk about more of our project design. Cool. Uh, so our project focused on the question, how do you get Cas9 into these OMBs? And uh, as illustration is showing, the first step that you need to do to get Cas9 into OMBs is to get Cas9 across that inner membrane into the periplasm. Um, so where it then can be incorporated into OMBs and then finally uh, <coughs> delivered to your cells to be uh, taken up. So our, yeah, we focused on the first part of just trying to get Cas9 into the periplasm as um, we achieved the goal this summer. 
and uh, looking at how to do that, we looked at the two transportation pathways that bacteria use to transport proteins to the plasm. Uh, attack and site sequences are pretty well known by some of us. Um, uh, so we use different si short signaling peptide sequences attached to our cation proteins um, to investigate if one or both of these was effective at moving our large Cas9 protein into there. We also investigate two outer membrane protein fusions that have been shown to work in literature to localize uh, proteins to outer membrane vesicles. Clay is a cytotoxin that actively is used at MIT to localize GFP. Oh, sorry, at Cornell. Yeah, thanks. At a Cornell to uh, localize GFP to OMBs. Um, and then INP is a segregation protein. Um, and that is promising because um, the second bullet point there is that it localizes proteins up to 114 kilodaltons, which is right around the size of our Cas9. Um, so speaking of the size of our Cas9, um, one of the challenges that we foresaw was the size of Cas9. <laughs> um, so um, we are actually we're using Staph Cas9, um, a different strain from the more commonly Strep Cas9. Uh, Staph Cas9 is about two thirds the size, um, like I said, around 115 to 19 kilodaltons. Um, and there. Also, um, using Staph Cas9, we're kind of hoping that we can, or in this, our submission of the parts to iGen, we can um, like participate in the community a little bit and get Staph Cas9 to be uh, used more commonly, more well characterized by other iGen teams. Um, so, the, our experimental process is first we want to clone our Staph Cas9 proteins, <coughs> figure out a good expression. Um, system for that and conditions, and then finally tested that Cas9 is active in um, just the cytoplasm, and then we'll move on to King2 cloning the signal sequences and uh, testing the expression of that. So our first construct is assembly in the Cas9. Um, we skip some assembly, so the iGen BioRix model didn't quite work for us, um, but that's okay. Um, we know that we have a his, uh, his tag on there for identification later, um, and put it under the uh, type promoter under recognition from our awesome grant to the student TAs. Um, thanks, Kelly. Um, so once you success successfully cloned that, you need to do expression questions. Um, uh, let's thank Ben for helping us out with these Western blocks. Um, <coughs> we're running uh, wholesale lessons of overnight expressions, expression cultures uh, for our regular cast, uh, our staff cast nine. And you can see up at the top is a really faint band around the expected size of, of the so, having verified that there's some protein there that we expected, we moved on to our functionality test. And for this, we had to uh, construct a gRNA um, device. So, we synthesized a gRNA scaffold, um, and that included a guide, uh, template guide sequence that can be swapped out with Golden Gate uh, for whatever specific sequence, sequence you want. And we cloned in that part into a vector that uh, includes MRP and <coughs> co transform those two plasmids together. Uh, one with a guide sequence that's just a template that doesn't target MRP, and one with a guide sequence that targets 100 base pairs and target MRP. Um, and lysis cultures, and saw a significant reduction in fluorescence in the cultures that had a guide sequence that targeted MRP versus the template, um, and then also a negative control with Chester Cas9 plasmid. So we're um, concluding that our Cas9 is actually there, and it is cutting um, the MRP as expected. Um, moving on to the assembly of our signal sequencing and uh, fusion proteins. We put, uh, we chose Torre uh, for TAD, DSPA, YCDO um, for our other signal sequences because of um, their like, prevalence in literature and um, like, the prevalence of their characterization. And then IMP, all those were attached at the end terminus um, of our proteins and clay. <coughs> was notably at the C terminus because it's a cytotoxin and that reduces its toxicity, um, as Matt Delisa showed. Um, cool, so now we're moving on to where we are now and kind of moving into the future. Uh, we're just beginning the initial expression test of our uh, fusion proteins and signal sequences. <coughs> um, so we're testing out uh, different whole cell lysates, paraplasm fractions, and OMB fractions of uh, cultures containing our signal sequences. Sequence Cas9 to determine if any of those were successful at localizing Cas9 in the um, 
that's going on currently, not finished with the expression conditions for those. Um, additionally, some, of, some immediate next steps would be to sequence those uh, cultures that we use in the nucleus uh, activity assay to see just what kind of mutations are happening in Cas9's cutting in the MRFP. Um, and then also swapping a guide RNA sequence that targets an anti-material resistant gene so we can test out our system in uh, the target that we actually are in. Long term, uh, deliver OMVs containing Cas9 to cells to investigate just the natural uptake of those uh, vesicles. And then also we're looking at methods of including the guide RNA part um, into our OMVs uh, because right now we're thinking maybe about preparation. Um, but that is our project. Staff Cas9 that worked with our GRNA part, um, and then also along with some other educational and collaborative accomplishments that we So, uh, so uh, it's more to take questions and uh, like any critical feedback that you want to give um, on the presentation or the project. to deliver the whole Cas9 complex into the your target bacterial cytoplasm using OMBs? 
Um, would like clinically or just like? Like yeah. So if you make the Cas9 into the OMBs, I assume you purify the OMBs and add it to bacterial cell. Mm -hmm. So that Cas9 would have to enter to the bacterial cytoplasm. So how do you propose targeting that big complex to enter into the bacterial cytoplasm? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that's another part touched on what Jordan was saying is that the uptake isn't as well studied. Um, I'm not sure. We do know that it happens. Uh, that's uh, I mean, that bacteria do uptake OMBs, and the contents of those OMBs do wind up in their cytoplasm. Uh, we don't know exactly how to direct that to ensure that it happens, but uh, that would definitely be a future step. And I've, I've actually over the like last few months, we've seen sort of more literature coming out on sort of the mechanism that they're taken up by in eukaryotes. So I imagine like. There's more literature being generated about this. I imagine it probably will be coming up in bacteria soon. I think people are looking into this. We just don't know quite yet. Um, and then so also sort of clinically, early applications we're thinking, and sort of the uh, sort of more IGEM calls it human practices, uh, but the uh, sort of looking into the social and clinical and uh, like farther out impact of the research. Uh, we were sort of looking at like er, what early kind of um, infections or like clinical applications would we start with, and we were thinking probably starting with like topical like skin infections would be uh, best for like safety and reasons and stuff. Yeah. Okay. So in terms of like clinical delivery into humans, you essentially have, or like correct me if I'm wrong, but um, three options. One, delivering Cas9, the protein, directly. Two, delivering it through OMBs. Or three, using a whole cell that produces the OMBs and then infects the uh, non-wanted bacteria. Um, do you see, do you know which of those three, or do you think of more options would be good, bad? Do you have an idea, like a concept of like what you would use? Um, so, just speculating, uh, it's probably safest to uh, put in purified OMBs. Uh, the whole point is to stop someone from being infected with a pathogen, some kind of invasive problem. Um, so, by implanting a new bacteria strain, we basically, in order to have that producing OMBs, you, you need to have a counter infection, and that, that would just cause its own problem, I imagine. Uh, unless Sometimes you're seeing the whole cell, but they're kind of few and far between. Now, because people have, like have pushed against them, like they're afraid of them. Okay. Um, but it's hot. You can like essentially heat kill the infectious part of. I guess the, what I'm getting at is largely, the... largely a lot of research that also has seen is I keep seeing more and more papers that are like using all of these specifically as vaccines, um, which is a lot of like where the sort of protein engineering is coming from. Like again, that's kind of explained. Um, so that's sort of just an aside. There's no good reason that I can think of to put in the strain directly instead of just grow it up separately and then purify the OMBs and then deliver those. But the, the whole point of using, and also to compare that to the third part of your question, which is why not just put in Cas9 directly, uh, there's no uh, good reason to suspect that bacteria will just uptake Cas9 without the OMBs. And then another big benefit to OMBs is that they uh, can package the guide RNA and the Cas9 together and they can bring it all in one package, and that way that ensures that they receive everything in a concentrated form all at once. Uh, so that's a huge advantage to just putting in molecules into the regular media. I was just kind of curious, you mentioned that things do end up in the cytoplasm. Like, what things specifically? Because I can imagine some of those, when they get eaten, they get digested, or like, they, they would depend on what you're trying to deliver, like on how variable that thing is. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> there's like the same paper that had the figure, um, this guy, um, had an update thing, and there were different, three, like three different pathways where you could just take that in the cytoplasm, uh, a little episode of the zone, they want to spot it, or um, have it degraded right away, um, and it wasn't clear in like how to direct which pathway you. Go down. So some get degraded, some don't. 
My my hypothesis for this would be, and sort of that goes under our design a little bit, is I think the uh, the <coughs> sort of free floating proteins that are actually incorporated into the uh, vesicle. So the there's a word for this. So that are just inside the vesicle, not embedded in the vesicle membrane. I think those would be ideal. So that's I think uh, a lot of why we're hoping that sort of the TAT side pathway uh, would be pretty effective because that would not embed in the membrane and would just sort of be in the periplasm and get um, incorporated into both these. Uh, I think that's probably the most uh, likely sort of method that will keep them integrated. <coughs> Uh, I liked your project in your talk, and I wanted to know a little bit more about the uh, the staff cast on issue or reason. Did you notice any differences, or have you learned about its expression or activity and how it differs from the, like, the strep cast on that most people use? Yeah. No, I don't. Oh, um, yeah, the M sequence is longer, so we're looking at less off target effects, um, which is one of the benefits of like, therapy application. Or therapy application. Um, we haven't investigated it yet to be a lot of besides if it is impacted. Um, so we're looking at investigating that. Yeah, that would be a very good year to actually uh, test that against uh, strep cas and that sort of probably like run a similar activity assay. But yeah, a big thing that we um, uh, we like about strep cas is sort of the, the uh, specificity and the longer time sequence of the data draw. Question. Uh, given that you have a, a longer PAM sequence, I would imagine that you also have sort of fewer sites in the genome that you can easily target. Uh, do you find with uh, staph cas 9 that you can easily find um, dye RNA sequences to cut the antibiotic resistance genes that you might want to cut down the line? Um, yeah, so one of the potential projects, or aspects of our project, was making a program that could find uh, viable dye RNA sequences without too many off-target effects. Um, that was a very early thing. Yeah, that was a modeling project. We um, abandoned it. Uh, there was, I think the gray line was, I'm not sure. Um, I'd like to guess that. Have you guys heard of like uh, CRISPR that I that be like, that there, are, there are web tools where you can just like, oh, cool. plug in your gene sequence and the web tools spit out dye RNAs. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think another one of our team members used it. Okay. I remember finding that and sending it to him for him to use. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah that's time. We'll be updated for that. Um, yes, also, there are like several more of us, um, uh, especially as one of our members is also up in the front, by the way. Um, and then we're also going to say Tyler uh, Lazar. This is Hefferton. So. Yeah, because not all of us, because we're under resume of class. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's a question here. Sorry, back to the uh, OMB. Can they get gram positive bacteria too? Yes. They can be delivered yeah. to any cell. Um, oh. well, basically, any cell? Ba not any cell. Okay. But basically, basically, <laughs> basically, basically uh, if it's shown to go to uh, if any any uh, category of cell is what I mean. Not just. Yeah. Okay. Yes, they can go to gram positive. <laughs> Okay. Uh, yeah, different teams use different methods. Uh, uh, the most effective one that we've seen is ultra, ultra um, centrifugation, uh, <clears throat> which we didn't really have available. So we actually, one of our collaboration projects was um, using a procedure developed by a team in Australia that just used uh, like, uh, 100 uh, filters and just spun, yeah, filters and spun them down and concentrated them. So you're suggesting to um, orally administer these OMBs. Do you know the you know genesity of these OMBs? Like how fast how they like they do get cleared by the immune system? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think we kind of touched on the early clinical applications being not orally administered um, like topical infections. But oh, so the thing about the LDS um, yeah, that and um, there's a gene protein uh, paper that puts like a gene protein on the on the membrane. Um, yeah, so there's different. Uh, I think you can sort of modify the membrane uh, with different proteins that will kind of match. Um, 
that um, from the immune system. Um, so I think people are already on Well, part of your project was most unexpectedly difficult. <laughs> <laughs>